Faculty of Social Sciences, Migration Research, which is at, this afternoon, had, or all day today, had a fascinating postgraduate conference. Uh, and now we're gathered for an equally fascinating event. Uh, I'm delighted to welcome to the university for our annual lecture, uh, Professor Alex Betts from the University of Oxford. Alex is Professor of Forced Migration and International Affairs at the University of Oxford, where he also directs the Refugee Studies Centre. And his work has had enormous impact, both academically, with a long list of highly influential publications, but also through the wider engagement he's able to develop based on his expertise in the area of refugees, uh, as we were just discussing through, for instance, his TED talk, but also a whole host of other activities which are uh, uh, very notable for the impact that they have. So I'm really delighted Alex has been able to come up here today and talk to us. What he's going to speak about is uh, the economic and political lives of refugees. Alex is going to talk for around 45 minutes, then we're going to have about half an hour or so for questions, and then afterwards we'd like to invite you all to join us for a reception in what's called the ICOS building, which is another kind of modernist glass building close to here, which uh, we can help you find. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Alex. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew, and thank you to all of you for coming. Um, I'm really delighted to be here. It's the first time I've spent any time at all in Sheffield, um, despite the fact that my wife was born here. So um, it helps me fill a gap in my sort of geography of the country as well as um, being able to join you. Um, my only real regret is that I wasn't here for lots of today when a lot of graduate students and postgraduates and doctoral students uh, postdocs were presenting really interesting work throughout the day and I've sort of been following that on the train on Twitter and I'm really sad to have missed a lot of it. Um, it's about 30 years, almost exactly, since Barbara Harrell Bond, the founder of my research centre in Oxford and in many ways the founder of Refugee Studies, wrote her seminal work, Imposing Aid. And in that 1986 book, she highlighted that the top-down imposition of humanitarian aid has a deeply perverse and distorting effect on the lives of refugees. She highlighted in particular that it often sees refugees as victims rather than as actors with agency and the capacity to shape their own lives. And in a way, what I want to do in this lecture is build upon that and argue something almost embarrassingly simple, which is that in the context of the refugee crisis, we have two dominant but highly misguided narratives that are often deployed around refugees. The first, that we often see them as an inevitable burden rather than a potential benefit to our society. And the second, that if we don't see them as a burden, we see them as passive victims without the agency and capacity to shape their own lives. And so I want to reframe that and suggest that without offering a single narrative or reporting to speak on behalf of a diverse cross-section of human beings. There are ways in which if we look at the economic and political lives of refugees, we can recognize their diversity, that they can benefit the communities they're part of, and that they can have the capacities to help themselves and their communities if we create structures in which that's possible. So what I'm going to do is draw upon two pieces of work that I've done over the last few years, both in the sub-Saharan African context. The first, looking at the economic lives of refugees. The second, looking at the political lives of refugees. Uh, both book projects that are coming out later this year. The first, called Refugee Economies, Forced Displacement and Development, which will come out with Oxford University Press. And the second, Mobilizing the Diaspora, How Refugees Challenge Authoritarianism, coming out with Cambridge University Press, the other people. Um, and what I'm gonna do is try and integrate them and suggest that they have common argument that they try to put forward. So before I get into that, where and how do I come to this? Well, this photograph looks very much like it could have been today. It looks like it could be the Balkan route across Europe. But it was actually 17 years ago. And it shows that if we get a sense of historical perspective, we've been here before. 17 years ago, some 800,000 Kosovar refugees sought asylum in other parts of Europe. They were predominantly Muslims, and Europe coped. It developed an emergency humanitarian evacuation scheme for refugees predominantly in Macedonia, and it redistributed them across Europe and to other parts of the world. 
It highlighted that Europe was able to cope in the previous era, and it was even able to cope with large numbers of Muslims. It also puts into context what I've argued, which is that the current crisis is not a crisis of numbers, it's a crisis of politics. That the numbers around the world of refugees are relatively small. There are some 20 million refugees, according to UNHCR's latest figures, 25 million if you include the Palestinians. Out of a global population of 7 billion, that should be manageable. When we take into account that a million refugees came to Europe last year, but that Europe is 28 EU member states, we should be able to manage that. The challenge is one of geographical concentration. Just 10 countries host nearly 60% of the world's refugees, and the political portrayal of these people as either a burden or as victims. <coughs> 17 years ago was the first time I started working with refugees. And at the time, I was an undergraduate, and I spent a summer as a volunteer in the reception center for uh, asylum seekers from around the world, from Kosovo, from Bosnia, from China, Iran, Iraq, uh, former Zaire, Liberia. And what struck me most was that people with skills, talents, and aspirations, and I spoke to lawyers, I spoke to former Olympians, who didn't inspire me with pity, but a sense of, wow, these people are extraordinary. They've got greater skills than I have. I can learn from these people. But the tragic irony was that they didn't have, for the most part, the right to work. At the time, some were stuck in the asylum system for sometimes three years, sometimes five years, sometimes longer, and denied the right to work while they waited for a bureaucratic procedure to kick in and to see whether they and their families would get refugee status. Now, at the time, as an economics undergraduate, that struck me as not only a gross injustice, but bad for Europe, bad for the Netherlands where I was, and something that wasn't making the best use of people's capacity and potential. As I traveled further around the world and embarked on my graduate research, I started working in Africa. And the tragedy was that that situation replicated. The standard humanitarian response was one of encampment. And when people weren't in camps and were in urban areas, they were denied humanitarian assistance and often denied the right to work, leading many to become destitute. <coughs> the encampment model, I think, is encapsulated by this example I often use of the Aliade refugee camp on the border where Djibouti joins Somaliland. And there, one of the people I met was Wuli, who's in the photograph on the right. And Wuli arrived in that camp in 1988. Um, so he's been there for his entire adult life. He was 18 when he arrived. And he said to me, man doesn't live on food and water alone, but on hope. My hope is gone, but I choose to pass it to the next generation. And so with a blackboard and chalk, he teaches maths and English language in a camp which has very, very limited access to post-primary formal education. And again, it highlighted that the international system is denying people's possibility to contribute, denying them the opportunity to flourish as human beings, but even in spite of those worst conditions. And this is a horrendous camp where the temperatures get up to 40 degrees Celsius, where there are very few opportunities, where it's remote from any kind of urban area or the host population. Even under those circumstances, people find ways to support themselves and their communities. The other thing that was present in the Ali Ade refugee camp was a political life. Despite the constraints, not only were there Somalis, but there were lots of Ethiopians, Oromo and Ogiben, who were mobilizing politically to think about how they could engage in contesting the politics of a fairly authoritarian regime back home. So in that relatively early stage of my research, I was struck by both the economic potential and the political potential. And so that's the two things I'm going to talk to you about. So to begin with the first aspect of what I want to talk about, the economic lives of refugees. The project we've started is called Refugee Economies. Now, we're not the first people to speak about the economic lives of refugees. There are two broad literatures that have, have considered this idea. Um, on the one hand, the literature on refugee livelihoods that's mainly qualitative and descriptive and recognizes that refugees have jobs, they seek employment, they create livelihoods opportunities for themselves. And a more recent literature on the economic impact of refugees on host states, 
which is mainly World Bank literature. The World Bank is today very keen to show that refugees have positive or negative impacts on host countries, so they can make a case for including refugees in national development plans. But the problem with both those literatures, for me, was they rarely thought about the economy from refugees' perspectives. What explains when refugees do well? What explains when they do badly? What explains variation in economic outcomes? When do they thrive? When do they merely survive? And so to think about that, we focused on that question of variation. And our basic theoretical premise is that refugees are no different from any other human beings. They're no different qua human beings from other groups of migrants or from host citizens. They're as diverse. They have the same often challenges in terms of variation in education, and the same capacities as human beings. But what makes them different is the different institutional and regulatory environment in which they find themselves. To be a refugee is to enter an institutional space that regulates your economic life in a different way from other migrants and other citizens. For instance, refugees are often placed between state regulation and the regulation imposed by international organizations, particularly humanitarian organizations. They often lie between national economic structures and transnational economic structures. They often sit in a precarious position between the formal economy and the informal economy. So refugeehood is unique in the sense that it imposes a different institutional, institutional structure. Now what we know from a branch of economics called New Institutional Economics is that when markets are changed and distorted by the institutions that structure those markets, it creates both opportunities and constraints. Some people do very well out of institutional distortions of markets. Some people do very badly. But it's those distortions that I think shape refugee economies as a particular area of study. And in this work, we started in a particular place. We chose to work in Uganda. Not because it's representative, it's not, but because it's actually pretty unique and different. What Uganda has done for a very long time, since it first received refugees in 1959 with the first influx of, of Rwandans, is adopt initially, informally and then formally, what it calls a self-reliant strategy. It gives refugees the right to work and it allows them freedom of movement. In rural areas, it gives them plots of land to cultivate. In urban areas, it allows them to work and to build businesses. And so it was an opportunity for us to look at what's possible when we do give refugees basic socioeconomic freedoms. <coughs> and the way we approach our research in this area is very participatory. It's a mixed method approach where we work with a team of refugee researchers who we've trained as peer researchers to be involved in our work. And they represent the different communities in Uganda, Somalis, Congolese, Sudanese, Rwandans, Burundians, men, women, and we sequence the work between a long period of in-depth qualitative research, drawing upon broadly anthropological methods, um, transect walks, focus groups, participant and non-participant observation. And only on the basis of that did we then build to a quantitative phase, developing and designing a survey based on representative sampling in camps and in urban areas to try to look at what explains that type of variation. And reflecting what I said earlier about our theoretical starting point of the regulatory environment and the institutional structure matters, and we wanted to test and explore that, we chose three sets of sites for our research. An urban context, the capital city Kampala, two protracted long-standing refugee camps, or in Uganda they're referred to as settlements, although camp encompasses a very large and diverse category of things, and an emergency context, Ramanja. Um, Lakivali and Changwali have been around for decades. Ramanja was around as early as the 1960s, but then closed down, and then it was reopened in 2012 for a mass influx of Congolese refugees. So broadly speaking, these are very different regulatory environments. In Kampala, people are relatively free to integrate with the national economy. In Kampala, in Changwali and Lakivali, they rely upon a degree of international support, food assistance, perhaps significant freedoms. In the emergency setting, there's very little pre-existing economy, and there's a lot of starting dependence upon international assistance. 
And we see that reflected in the variation in income levels that we see across the three sides. So what we tend to see is that the highest levels of income are found in Kampala, the capital city, followed by the long-standing settlements, followed by the emergency context. And what we see, of course, is that, yes, there's a concentration of relatively low income, but particularly in the city and particularly in the settlements, there is huge diversity of income levels. These figures are in Ugandan shillings, but to give you an idea, the average um, income is around 30 US dollars a month, but the spectrum is much broader. It goes up to a small number of outliers, earning up to 660 US dollars a month. And so that really was partly what we wanted to explain. Why do some do better than others? Broadly speaking, in terms of the regulatory environment, we can think about three different ways in which these contexts are quite different. They vary in terms of the authority, regulating governance, the nature of the infrastructure and its geographical scope, and also how highly regulated the economic lives of refugees are compared to those of other members of the national and migrant communities. There's a spectrum then where in the urban context there's relative integration through to an emergency context where it's a highly differentiated and distinguished economic system. Just to give you a flavour for what each of these is like and, and why they're quite distinct economies. Kampala is an area where refugees are integrated to a large extent. But different <coughs> refugee populations are geographically concentrated in particular areas of the city. For instance, Somalis live in an area called Kisenyi. Many of the Congolese live in an area called Zambia. Um, the Somalis are particularly integrated within Kisenyi and have transnational connections that are much wider. They have connections that extend to um, the Eastly area of Kenya, to other Kenyan refugee camps across the region, Kuma, Dadaab, to Somali supply chains around the world, from Mombasa to Saudi Arabia uh, and to South Central Somalia. And one of the things about the Somalis that was particularly interesting was they had links to ethnic Somali Ugandans. For instance, in their employment, they relied upon businesses run by ethnic Somali Ugandans. One of those businesses is a, is a uh, petrol company called uh, City Oil. And there, many Somalis are able to use their ethnic kinship to get access to jobs. Um, Somalis in Kisenyi have social protection schemes called Ayutos where, for instance, many single female-headed households combine their savings so that when someone's unemployed or falls on hard times, they can withdraw from the pot of money to support one another. But in Kampala, different communities have different forms of dominant livelihoods activities. Many of the Eritrean community run um, internet cafes. Many Rwandans bring agricultural products, dairy, sorghum, into the city and sell it in the Awino market. Many of the Ethiopians are taxi drivers. And to some extent, those are cliches that mask diversity. But nevertheless, you get patterns of particular nationalities building dominant livelihoods activities, sharing skills in particular ways. There's huge diversity, though, in Kampala. We see examples of very entrepreneurial activities where refugees are creating businesses and employing others, including nationals. The context of Nakivali and Changwali, the two largest settlements in Uganda, is quite different. Um, they're in remote rural areas. They're both relatively close to urban areas. Nakivali um, is close to Barara and Changwali, close to a town called Hoima. And in both cases, given the long-standing nature of the settlement, Ugandan nationals come and go. They build businesses, come to the markets in the settlement, buy and sell. They're predominantly agricultural in structure. Refugees have plots of land, they grow products. Ugandan middlemen come and buy and purchase commodities and sell them to market, transporting them to Barara, Hoima, and the capital campaign. There's also access to humanitarian aid, but most refugees in the settlements can't depend upon humanitarian assistance. And these areas feel very much um, like cities. I think one thing's interesting though is the diversity of livelihood activities you see. Yes, farming and farm work and plot cultivation dominate, 
but we also see a lot of entrepreneurial activity, a lot of hawking, a lot of buying and selling wares to markets, including to and from the Ugandan community. And what's also interesting is the Somalis, even though they are a significant presence, particularly in Nakibali, don't engage in farm work or cultivate land. When Somalis are given a plot of land, they tend to either rent it out and charge <coughs> rent for it to other refugees in the community, or they convert it to a shop. They tend to prefer to do commerce rather than agriculture. And yet the insistence of the international community is when you arrive, we give you a plot of land to cultivate. Now, the data and what you observe makes it pretty obvious that Somalis just don't want to do that. They want to do something else. And they're not used to uh, these kinds of agricultural activities coming predominantly from a pastoral culture. The third site is particularly interesting. It's called Ramanja. And we added this shortly after starting the research process. And the reason we did this is because <coughs> it helped us think about what happens to a refugee economy in an emergency scenario. What happens when we don't look at pre-existing settlement, but when we look at a settlement that's in the process of being created and structured, where Congolese refugees fleeing M23 related violence uh, in North Kivu had come across the border, rarely being able to bring capital or saving, except for a few cases. What do they do with no pre-existing economy, with no pre-existing neighboring town? And that dynamic process was really fascinating. Initially, the government heavily regulated Romanjo. It denied economic activity. But despite that, informally, refugees started selling their world food program food rations, the commodities, non-food items they were given by UNHCR, and they took that funding, and some outliers invested that in setting up businesses. And then as those businesses emerged, Ugandans moved <coughs> towards Romanja. Other refugees, particularly Congolese refugees from other parts of the country, decided to also move towards Romanja. And so, for instance, the Ugandan chairperson of a host village in the neighboring community said, things have changed so much since the arrival of refugees, not only refugees, but many Ugandans have since moved to this area because of economic reasons. So a market has been created out of nothing by that entrepreneurship, even under heavily regulated circumstances. <laughs> so moving from this particular to what our data tells us on a more aggregate level across the science. We decided in our early publication of this work to structure it around five myths that we challenge that I won't spend too much time on, but to give you an idea. The first myth our data challenges is the idea that refugees are economically isolated. They're not. This photograph illustrates a Congolese ceremonial fabric called Batenge. It's used for marriages and births and special occasions. When we asked international agency staff where Batenge comes from, they said it probably comes across the border from the Democratic Republic of Congo. But when we asked refugees, they had a different story. They said it's coming from factories in India and China, <laughs> and that they're part of global supply chains. And they're importing it into the Aweno market in Uganda, controlling supply chains across the country, and they are part of the globalized economy, even in remote rural areas. And that applied to lots of commodities. Um, Somalis often like tuna fish. Tuna fish is very hard to find in southwest Uganda. So tuna fish from Thailand comes via Saudi Arabia through Mombasa and into Somali shops in the community. The communities are very capable of plugging into global supply chains. Second myth we were able to challenge is that refugees are a burden. They are generally not. For instance, in Kampala, given the right to work, 21% of the refugees we surveyed run businesses that employ at least one person. And of those they employ, 40% are Ugandan nationals. In other words, refugees are making jobs for host nationals. The third myth we were able to challenge was the idea that refugees are economically homogenous. As I showed you, there's huge diversity in terms of income levels. Yes, there's a concentration at lower levels, but we see a lot of outliers. And some people engage in things that you generally don't expect to see in a refugee camp. This is Demu K. Demu K, when he arrived, decided he wanted to set up a community radio station. And when he'd done that, he decided he wanted to be a documentary filmmaker and that he would charge gullible international researchers and academics <laughs> like us to make documentary films for us. And he did a really good job. And he's been able to scale his work and be very effective in doing that. And there are lots of examples like that. The fourth myth is that refugees are technologically illiterate. 
Um, I think in the refugee crisis, people have become aware that refugees use SMS technology, they use social networks, they use Facebook, that it's fundamental. But even in more remote contexts like rural Uganda, we see huge SMS and mobile phone technology. 46% of refugees in the settlements have access to SMS technology, 89% in urban areas. Where broadband is available, they also use the internet. It's just the coverage that's problematic. And they're not just using these technologies socially, they're using them for the primary business activities, to share business information, to transfer money electronically. And I think we often neglect that. But equally, there are examples of other more low-level technologies. The innovation on the right is a converted bicycle for sharpening tools, um, being written by a Congolese refugee. Um, and as I found, if you cycle it in the wrong direction, the sparks will fly through the face. Um, the fifth myth we challenged was that refugees are dependent. Again, they are absolutely not. In all of the data we look at, <coughs> 1% of refugee households have no source of independent income generating activity. That's not to say they didn't partly receive international assistance, but nobody could live just on food rations and handouts from the international community. So refugees get on with it by themselves. And they find often ways to integrate with social enterprises. On the left is a photograph of uh, a social enterprise called Makapad. It's run by a Ugandan social entrepreneur called Moses Musasi and they make a female sanitary product called the Macapad. It's made from sustainable papyrus leaves, and it's built in a factory where refugees are employed in the Chakatu settlement in Uganda. It's then sold back to the UN Refugee Agency to distribute to refugees. And it's become a sustainable business that Moses Musasi has then subsequently scaled across Uganda. So a product for refugees with employment opportunities and integrating with entrepreneurship in the host economy. More broadly at the aggregate level, we've also engaged in econometric analysis of our, our data set. Um, there wouldn't be much point in collecting that much representative data if we, we didn't do some analysis of it. And one example of the findings is the question of what explains variation in income levels? Why do we see the variation that, that I started with? And there are a number of variables that seem to matter. Regulation really matters. As I said, there's variation between Kampala, the long-standing settlements, and the emergency settlement. But the lesson that comes out of that is the more socioeconomic freedom and the less heavily regulated refugees' economic lives are, the better they do. Education also inevitably matters. The returns to education for refugees are enormous, and they go up as you go through the education system. So for each year of primary education, that refugees in Uganda receive, their income goes up by an average of 2.4% per year. For each year of secondary education a refugee in Uganda receives, their income goes up by an average of 4.5% per year. And for tertiary education, we found it to be 6.2%. We also found that occupation inadvertently has significant effects on income levels. <coughs> Farmers tend to do less well than those who are employed in non-farming sectors, 37% less well. The people who do best are those who are self-employed in non-farming sectors, who do 23% better than those who are employed um, in non-farming sectors. Years in exile matter. And while there's a boon from the first year of being a refugee compared to those who are present longer, the longer you stay in exile, the more your income diminishes. So the more time you're in a protracted refugee situation, the more your income capacity goes down until the effect turns negative for 13 years. Gender matters significantly. Single women do worse, married men do best. So that tells you a little bit about the economic lives of refugees. I can't stress enough how unrepresentative Uganda is. We chose it because it's a positive case. But I think what it highlights is that if we allow refugees to economically be self-sufficient and give them those opportunities, we can at least see that there are positive opportunities for them to help themselves. What about refugees as political actors? 
There's a literature on the politics of refugees, political science and international relations over the last 20, 30 years have thought about the politics that shapes outcomes for refugees. When we think about those questions, we tend to think about what explains the behavior of states or international organizations towards refugees, rather than the political lives of refugees themselves. So we lack the basic recognition that refugees themselves are political actors. They are engaged in world politics. And this has been present for a long time. The African National Congress in exile across Southern Africa during apartheid. The examples of, for instance, the Rwandan Patriotic Front in Uganda for a long time. Communities from Liberia being in the United States. Exiles, diasporas around the world <coughs> in effect on the politics of the homeland and going back and restructuring those countries have been recognized for a long time. But rarely do we think in terms of refugees being political actors. And one of the reasons this is so important is that around the world, more than half of the world's population live in authoritarian or competitive authoritarian states. Now, by definition, what happens in many of those authoritarian states is the political space for contesting the incumbent regime is not present on the territory of that state. That doesn't mean that political life is extinguished, but it often means it moves outside the territory of that country. It often means it's those who have left those authoritarian regimes as refugees or exiles who are in a position to continue the struggle of opposition politics abroad, often through transnational networks. And so we wanted to explore the question of how refugees challenge authoritarianism when they go into exile. Why do some form really strong opposition political structures? And why do some not? So for instance, certain populations, uh, the Ugandan community, the Sudanese community, don't tend to mobilize particularly strongly politically. Other groups of refugees are particularly politically active abroad and form strong networks that contest the state. Why and how? And when are they successful when they do mobilize? So we've looked, doing qualitative research at two cases, looking at about 15 or 20 years of transnational history. Zimbabwe and Rwanda, two authoritarian states, different models, and tried to understand the conditions under which refugees from those countries have engaged with the politics of the homeland state and to what effect. And there's slightly different stories. The story of Zimbabwe involved us doing research in South Africa, Botswana, the UK, the United States looking at how when people fled Zimbabwe in the early 2000s, leaving Mugabe's regime, they built opposition networks, particularly around the MDC, but also independently of the MDC, and what effect that had at different periods in the struggle against Mugabe's Zimbabwe. We've also looked at Rwanda, which is a bit different. What's happened in Rwanda since the 1994 genocide, since Paul Kagame came to power and became increasingly authoritarian over time, is that there's been a two-way struggle. Opposition parties like FDU and Kingi have mobilized abroad, but so has the Rwandan government. The Rwandan government has operated a mobilization of its own diaspora abroad, structuring the Rwandan diaspora in exile to contest the opposition, and in some cases do that through threats and coercion and even assassinations. We wanted to document that type of conversation and how it's worked. I'm mainly going to focus on the Zimbabwean community. Our theoretical starting point for this work was a dissatisfaction with the emerging diaspora studies literature. Diaspora studies tends to come up with a definition of a diaspora as a population that has a number of characteristics. It's been dispersed around the world, it's tried to preserve a distinct identity, and it has an ongoing orientation towards the homeland. But a lot of diaspora studies assume diasporas just exist. They're, they're sort of there. They've always been there. They're ahistorical, they're apolitical. Whereas for us, diaspora is essentially a political move. It is to have business with the homeland. It is to have an ongoing struggle and an ongoing engagement that identifies transnationally with the homeland. And some communities don't mobilize transnationally and politically to the same extent as others, creating a puzzle. And others in the literature have recognized the inadequacy of that reified, essentialized and ahistorical view of diasporas. Rogers Brubaker, for instance, says that rather than speak of a diaspora or the diaspora as an entity, a bounded ground, an ethno-demographic <coughs> or ethno-cultural fact, 
It may be more fruitful and certainly more precise to speak of a diasporic stances, projects, claims, idioms, practices, and so on. We can then study empirically the degree and form of support for a diasporic project among members of its putative constituency, just as we can do when studying a nationalist project. So, in other words, diasporas don't come preformed and pre-exist. They ebb, they wane, and they flow. Some are quasi-permanent. The Jewish diaspora, for instance, the Armenian diaspora. But others take on a different form. And for instance, the Zimbabwean diaspora, which has been labeled the new diaspora, didn't exist in its present form prior to the exile of refugees fleeing Mugabe's Rwanda. And when it did emerge, it's gone through a period, if you like, a life cycle. A birth, a life, a death, and an afterlife. It came into existence with um, exile, particularly following 2003, the creation of lots of Zimbabwean diaspora organizations, notably in South Africa. A high point around the 2008 election and the creation of a power sharing agreement and a government of national unity in Harare. And then following 2008, its activities diminished, it was largely dismantled, and you ended up with shock front briefcase activists continuing to exist, but without support. So for us, why does that take place? Why do you get periods of mobilization? And the story that comes out of our research is that a lot of these organizations that emerge do so with external backing. There's a political economy where it's naive to assume that any organization labeling and self-identifying as diasporic is necessarily representative of a community. Sometimes diasporic organizations are representative, building quasi-democratic structures within. Sometimes they do meaningful work that reaches into their community. But other times, they're the instrument of political actors, the instrument of donors, funders, governments around the world seeking to do particular things for good or worse. Between 2003 and 8, the Zimbabwean diaspora had effects on politics and on even the governance of migration. It managed to do a couple of things. One of its main successes was it managed, for instance, to block an arms shipment from China destined for Harare uh, in Durban and stop that through mobilizing, through raising media attention, and persuading the South African government to block that arms shipment. It also, in the South African Supreme Court, mobilized a torture docket case, persuading the government to list and catalog examples of torture and take them into account within South Africa's jurisdiction. It also had successes in trying to persuade the South African government to adopt a moratorium on the deportation of Zimbabwean refugees back to Zimbabwe with various degrees of success. But by 2008, when the international community had supported diasporic activity, the diaspora activity waned with the creation of the government of national unity. And at that point, when the movement for democratic change failed to win the election, the international community, particularly the UK government, slightly gave up on trying to mobilize the diaspora. Some Zimbabweans were able to go home, but many hundreds of thousands remained in South Africa and continue to be there today, too afraid to go back. So we spent a lot of our research time using, this is called MindX, it's a way of mapping networks. We mapped the political network of Zimbabweans transnationally, looked at the particular individuals and organizations and their structures, and we found a number of things. One of the main explanatory variables behind mobilization of particular organizations was international support, based on political motives. Some of those political motives were to try and contest the Mugabe regime by mobilizing transnationally. The British government, through uh, the Foreign Office, through the British High Commissioner in Pretoria, the Open Society Institute, the US government, the Olaf Palm International Center funded by Swedish money, all put money into particular diasporic organizations without generally doing particular amounts of homework or due diligence on what those organizations were, what their aims were, or how effective would they, they would be. But by 2008, embarrassed by the association, embarrassed by the fact that demonizing Mugabe was leading to perverse consequences and re-legitimating it in Harare, they largely pulled the funding they put in selectively at an earlier stage. But alongside that, largely bypassed by the international community, 
were larger, more inclusive mass structures. This illustrates uh, a group of the Movement for Democratic Change branch in Pretoria. And for a while, that MDC branch was supported by the MDC headquarters in Harare. But then from 2008, they were largely ditched. So by the time we get to the most recent elections in Harare, Morgan Spangarai stops lobbying for the diaspora vote. He gives up on the diaspora vote and says people will have to come home to Zimbabwe if they're going to vote. But those mass structures continue, largely ignored, without elite recognition. At the local level, a lot of diasporic organizations provide basic bread and butter engagement. They provide humanitarian support and services, including at the now famous Central Methodist Church in Johannesburg, which hosted over 3,000 uh, Zimbabwean refugees. They were politically active, politically engaged. You could go to the church and engage in interesting discussions about Zimbabwean politics. But the international community's support for those types of activities was much less. And as many Zimbabwean refugees would tell you, their ability to engage in Zimbabwean politics from abroad depended upon being able to meet their basic day-to-day -day needs. So one of the challenges is that there are windows of opportunity that emerge here for engaging refugees to contest the politics back home. One example of that is with the succession debate over Mugabe's successor in Zimbabwe. The question is, who will that successor be, and to what extent the diaspora can be influential in that? But it relies upon a different model of diaspora engagement and refugee engagement by elites around the world. Our funding structures, our own politics, fail to understand what already exists and build on that, and we tend to build structures of engagement around diasporas that ignore the initiative and agency of the populations themselves. So what do these two narratives have in common? The argument that refugees have important economic lives, but they also have significant political lives. They argue that we need to fundamentally rethink our models of refugee assistance around the world. That at the moment, going back to Barbara Harrell Bonds and where I started, the dominant model is one where we assume that we can provide top-down assistance that it's enough to provide food, clothing, shelter, water, to leave people in camps, or provide assistance in urban areas. But what that does is it undermines people's capacity, it undermines their agency, it undermines their autonomy, and it misses real opportunities to change the narrative from burden to benefit, from vulnerability to capacity, from passivity to agency. And so I think what we need to start doing is helping people to help themselves and their communities. But that needs to start not just with a woolly narrative of self-reliance, or the kind of thing we've seen recently in Istanbul at the World Humanitarian Summit, of claiming we need to bridge the humanitarian development divide. It needs to understand what already exists, what people are doing for themselves and their communities, and how we can build on those initiatives. So for instance, if we want to engage with refugees' market capacities, don't build livelihood projects as the international community does, where you turn up in communities and say, put your hand up if you want to be a beekeeper. Figure out what people are actually doing. Understand how the market works in an integrated, ecosystemic way. How one person's activities in one place have connections across a country between an urban area and a camp. How transnationally embedded refugee settlements are. And if you do that, you'll recognize different types of opportunity for market engagement at the local level and the national level. Not just multinational corporations, but generally, genuinely embedded economic activity. Similarly, on the political side, we need to recognize that if we want to rebuild countries and societies like Syria, countries and societies like Afghanistan and Iraq, then we need to see the populations abroad, not just as passive, humanitarian people in need of our protection, but the people who we will rebuild those societies, both in the future and in the present. And if we understand their political engagement, we can empower them to challenge authoritarianism, politically and economically be part of the reconstruction. And it's incumbent on societies like ours when we receive refugees to take responsibility, to incubate those populations, and ensure that they go back stronger and that their transnational engagement supports populations <coughs> around the world. So I'm going to leave it there and leave plenty of time for question and answer. Thank you very much.